Today, I'd like to start in on a series where we take a look at the orchestration of a well-known band piece. And we're going to start off with one of the big ones, and that is Florent Schmidt's Dionysiacs. And for this course, I want everyone to head over to imslp.org and find the public domain score that is available there. I have it printed off as well as on the screen here. And this is going to be a great uh, chance to really dive deep into what I consider one of the best orchestrated band works of all time. In this video, we're going to take a look at the instrumentation that Schmidt used. Now this brings us to a really important issue, and that is that most of the time when Dionysiacs is performed, it is not in Schmidt's original instrumentation. It has been changed for a more quote-unquote modern wind band. The problem with this is in so doing, we lose Schmidt's original tone colors. In the description down below, I will link to both the original score on IMSLP as well as a performance where the original instrumentation is used. This piece was written for the Guard the Guard Republican Band in Paris. It was the big uh, wind band in Paris, the professional wind band, and it was started in 1914, but not fully published until 1925. So let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, woodwinds first. So we'll start up here at the top, and again, all of this is in French, so I'll do some translating here. It says, two piccolos right here, two petit flute en ut. And you'll have to forgive my uh, French pronunciation. Uh, I studied Spanish and German in school, and French was never uh, one of the languages I studied. So, two piccolos in C. The en ut in C is important because at this time there was also piccolos in D flat. And he's just letting us know that this is actually an orchestral C piccolo and not a military band D flat piccolo. Two grand flute, and that's the term for just a regular C flute. Now it says two, but you can do it with four, just in case you want a little bit extra power. Two oboes, and then one cor anglais or English horn. Note the marking here ad lib, meaning if you don't have it, you don't have to have it. He also says, but if you have it, you could use two. These two terms here seem to counter indicate one another. Ad lib, or if you've got it, use two. I tend to ignore the ad lib mark, as well as the or two mark. So you really do need the English horn in this. Same with the bassoons here. Uh, you've got ad lib, or you know, if you've got it, use four of these guys. There's no way you can perform this piece without the bassoon parts. They're just too integral to it. We have a sarusophone, uh, contrabass en ut. Of course, if you have it, you can use two of them. Or just leave it out entirely. These ad lib or use extra markings probably are one of the reasons people feel that they can start messing with the instrumentation of this piece. It's like, oh, he wasn't exactly accurate. You could fudge around a little bit, but in reality, you've, you've got to have it. Now, the contrabass sarusophone part here is for the instrument in C. If, as we go through the piece, we'll notice that it really does need to be a contrabass sarusophone in C and not the much, much more common contrabass sarusophone in E flat. The problem with that is there are, as far as we know, only six extant contrabass sarusophones in C in the world. And that includes one modern instrument built in the 
uh, late 1990s. Um, and then five historic instruments. The Guard Republican Band probably owned one of those uh, C contrabass sarusophones at the time. So it would have been a guaranteed instrument. However, most performances on this will use a contrabassoon part or a contrabassoon to cover the part. Let's move on to clarinets. Two petite clarinets on me and I can't, I don't remember the French word for flat, but it's two E flat clarinets. Or four if you've got it. Let's just stick with the lower end of the numbers from here on out. So two E flat clarinets. And this is something that will strike fear into the hearts of a lot of band directors. Particularly band directors who don't even like having one E flat clarinet. What, now we have to have two? Yep, you gotta have two. Two solo clarinets in B flat. The solo clarinets here are treated very differently than first and second clarinets. In fact, I have been told, and this was in a conversation I had with uh, Johan DeMay uh, on this very subject, that the solo clarinets would have actually been placed in a different position within the Guard Republican Band. The solo clarinets would have been placed exactly where the clarinets are in the orchestra. And it would also be next to the bassoons and the English horn and the oboes and the flutes just exactly as you'd have it in the orchestra. And then the first and second clarinet parts would be placed exactly where you'd have the first and second violins in the orchestra. And notice the numbers here on the first and second clarinets, 12 and 12. That mirrors the numbers typically seen in a fairly large orchestra for violins. 12 first violins, 12 second violins. Well, here we have 12 first clarinets, 12 second clarinets, and then the two solo clarinets act as the orchestral clarinets. We have two bass clarinets and one contrabass clarinet, and it's a B flat on both of those. The contrabass clarinet at this time was really pretty unusual. Uh, only a handful of instruments were being used. Most of these were the Fontaine Besson contrabass clarinets, and we'll see the part. Notice here that these are both written in bass clef, so that the bass clarinets will sound a major second lower, and the contrabass clarinet will sound a major ninth lower. And we do need two bass clarinets. And you can see right here in the very, uh, in bar three, the a due marking. Next, saxophones. Two alto saxophones, two tenor saxophones, two baritone saxophones, and a bass saxophone. We need a minimum of seven saxophones to perform this piece. And yes, all these parts will devise at some point. And if you want, you could double it. Here is something, though, that looks very strange to us. Look at this minimal brass section here. Two C trumpets, and not B flat trumpets, C trumpets. Two cornet a piston. These are B flat cornets, regular old B flat cornets. Two cor and fa. That's just the regular old horn. And we have four trombones, first, second, third, and trombone bass. This marking right here is unusual, and I've not quite figured out exactly what's going on here because the French generally did not use a bass trombone. He also marked it uh, as oot, which means it's in C, it's not transposing. There are a few theories I've come up with on exactly what he's using. One, it could be that he's using the old military style E flat bass trombone. That would have been somewhat in use in uh, the Parisian military bands, at least in the 1800s. I'm not sure how long that tradition carried on into the early 1900s. It could be that he's using a valve uh, bass trombone or even a valve contrabass trombone. The valve contrabass trombone does seem to have some precedence. We know Sasson used it early on in his career. 
Uh, Vincent Dandy would use it as well. He would use three tenors and a contrabass, or two tenors and a contrabass. And the bass trombone just wasn't in use in France at this time. Let's go on and look at our percussion section. Three timpani, easy enough. Military drum, uh, this is going to be like a tenor drum, not a tenor drum, a field drum. Uh, Casa Roulant. Um, so we have a, a military drum and a snare drum here, and I can't remember which is which. Uh, tambour de Basque is a tambourine, castanet, triangle, tam-tam, cymbals, -tam, uh, and bass drum. Now we have our tuneful percussion, as Granger would say. Jeu de tambour is a keyboard glockenspiel. And anytime you see Jeu de tambour, uh, particularly Schmidt or Ravel, um, I think Debussy as well, it's going to be a keyboard glockenspiel. Or uh, the famous uh, passage from Ducas' um, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Xylophone and Interestingly, he writes it as Celeste Mustel, and Mustel is the brand name. Um, the Mustel company is the, the manufacturer who invented the Celeste. Now here at the bottom, we get into some more weirdness. We've got another section down here. So let's go just to the bottom and skip over these real quick. We have two contrabass accord. That's string bass. Easy enough. You can tell that right here, measure three, when you see the term pizzicato. Well, only string instruments can do pizzicato. As for the rest of this, these are sax horns. This is the rest of our brass section. Oddly, he's placed the sax horns here in the position where they would be in an orchestra if they were the string instruments. So let's take a look at our section. A Petite Bugle. That's a Sopranino sax horn, aka a Sopranino flugelhorn in E flat, pitched a perfect fourth above our standard B flat flugelhorn. Then we have two bugles in B flat, two sections, A and B. Why he didn't call this uh, first and second like he does with the clarinets up top, I don't know. Uh, just perhaps uh, an interesting quirk of Schmidt's. But the bugle is the French name for the flugelhorn. So we have one Sopranino flugelhorn and then four regular B-flat flugelhorns. And then we have al three instruments called altos. These are alto horns or tenor horns if you're British, followed by two baritones, two baritone horns. This is the exact same makeup as the interior section of the British brass band. Three alto horns and two baritone horns. Now, the next two cause a little bit of confusion for people seeing the score for the first time. Six basses in B flat. These are euphoniums. And this is a bass clef euphonium part, but the part is written a major second higher than it sounds. So all these notes, that opening C sharp right there in the, the bass in C flat, well, that's actually the B natural one step lower. And then contrabasses in B flat, these are B flat contrabass tubas. And it has the same kind of transposition, except we have to add one more octave. So this C sharp right here is actually gonna sound down a B natural below the bass clef. So that'd be B1. So take that into consideration when you're reading through this. The basses in, in B flat read a step lower. The contrabasses in B flat read a ninth lower. It's an interesting notation quirk that you'll see in a lot of European scores, uh, particularly French and sometimes even uh, Dutch scores will still use this notation. I've got a few more modern scores that use it. But by and large, it's a, it's a thing of the past. 
So we've got essentially the full family of saxhorns minus, interestingly enough, the E flat uh, bass saxhorn or E flat contrabass saxhorn or just the E flat tuba. So that seems to have not really been used much in this style of music. We have six euphoniums and six tubas and the, he wants them all six contrabass tubas and not use the intermediary size that's popular in other places, particularly in England. The E flat size is much more popular. So with these quirks of the instrumentation of Dionysiacs, it's easy to see why there are transcriptions of it. It's uh, weird to say there's a transcription of a band work for band, but it exists. It's also to see why this piece laid dormant for many years. It was written in 1914, published 1925, and it really didn't start getting played until the 1950s. People looked at it and said, it's too hard. It's got these weird instruments that we don't see. I mean, how many of these instruments in the first part of the 20th century would you see in American bands? You certainly wouldn't see contrabass clarinets. Those are ultra rare. Um, you wouldn't see most of these sax horns down here. And these sax horn parts are one of the cores of this piece. If you take out the sax horn parts, think of it almost like you've taken out the string section in the the orchestra. And notice how they're placed in the string section or in the placement of where the string section will go in the orchestra. So keep this in mind as we start delving in to Dionysiacs. And in the first, uh, or excuse me, in the next video, we'll take a look at the first section of this up until the initial allegro.